Ari Herzog, I invited, I'm guessing, everyone here, so thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to introduce a couple um, folks in the audience before we get started. Um, the speakers, I'll be introducing all the speakers one by one uh, as they speak. Um, but I would like to call out uh, Rob Rothberg right here. He's on the Newburyport Cable Advisory Committee. Uh, Mike Strauss, if you could wave your hand. Mike is the chairman of the Newburyport Energy Advisory Committee. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the operation of Port Media, which is our community access station for uh, recording and videotaping this um, uh, event. Uh, Sarah Hayden, the director, if you could wave your hand, Sarah, thank you. Um, any other elected or appointed folks from other communities in the room tonight? Sure. Uh, Ryan Sawyer from the um, Gloucester Cable Advisory Committee, as well as Karen Spencer from the Gloucester CAC, and Tom Manning from the CAC in Gloucester as well. Thanks a lot. Um, I don't have enough copies of the agenda to pass out, but just to let you know what's going to be happening tonight, and then I'm going to provide some background. Um, I'm going to start off with some introductions. After me will be Greg Whalen, uh, and I'll be introducing him and his background. Greg will give an overview of Broadband 101. Um, after him will be Lenny Mirror, who's a state representative and owner of a uh, Mirror company. It's a construction company. He'll be providing information about trends in broadband industry. Uh, following him is our keynote, Dan Vortherms, who heads up the Open Cape Corporation. Um, next will be Ryan Sawyer from the Gloucester CAC, followed by Don Skane, who's the IT director for the New Report School District. Um, then we'll take a short stretch break, bathroom break, reconvene for Q&A and a straight table discussion. Um, so I'm Ari Herzog, I'm on the New Report City Council. I'm also the council's liaison to the Cable Advisory Committee here. We're currently in the process of negotiating with Comcast for a renewal. And I'm also a candidate for state representative myself. But more than that, I'm a tech geek and I'm, I'm a professional networker. Four years ago, I led a grassroots movement to try to bring Google to New Report if Google was launching its fiber network. Um, they wanted a community, ideally one community, to launch an ultra high speed broadband network. I completed their request for information and after connecting with people throughout the community, to my knowledge, a couple thousand people submitted petitions to Google saying, yes, we want high-speed fiber in Newberry Report. Ultimately, the project was awarded to Kansas City, and other communities have since joined in since. The idea behind the Google project was to deliver data at 100 times faster than the speeds we have today. Uh, the idea was one gigabit fiber to the home connections. So why Newberry Report? Why was that Google Fiber idea in the report? Well, we are home to descendants of the Mayflower. We have a significant manufacturing base, a daily and weekly newspaper, a radio station, two museums, a state park, and a hospital. Uh, New Report is the birthplace of Francis Cabot Lowell, who introduced the Industrial Revolution to the United States, and he's known as the father of the stock market. Uh, New Report is the home of the Coast Guard. Innovation continues today. I made a note that five years ago, the US Patent and Trademark Office awarded 42 patents to 25 new report inventors in just one year. Um, those were patents involving image analysis, computer security, wireless communication, and medical devices. Anna Jake's Hospital, our community hospital, is one of three medical centers in the state that piloted a uh, program in electronic medical records. But another new report. Across the North Shore, we are one of 10 communities that contribute to 73% of the creative economy. And approximately 20,000 people in a 30 mile radius are employed in advertising, architecture, consulting, engineering, and related industries. Um, some of you may be in those industries. The North Shore is neither comprised of large, dense cities nor small, underserved towns. We have the advantages of big cities with high-cost broadband and little fiber infrastructure. There are no high-rise developments, and 
This makes for an easy deployment of fiber. Comcast and Verizon hold a duopoly across the North Shore. Here in New Report, it's just Comcast, primarily. Some people have DSL for Verizon. Um, I wrote that uh, Comcast is the main player with an average residential data service of 16 to 20 megabits per second with an option of 50 meg, and apparently Comcast either now is or might be soon deploying 100 meg residential service. Of course, there's a cost to that. Um, I'd like us to think about the benefits of virtual commuting, distance learning, web-intensive businesses, server farms, government videography, and other technologies which are limited in, in performing today because of both the lack of high-speed broadband and because of the lack of competition to drive down cost. Let's focus less on what a fiber network can do for this region. Let's focus more on what makes this region attractive to a fiber network. So, uh, there was a question earlier on, someone was asking about a hashtag for this event. Why don't we use Fiber Forum? So that's pound Fiber Forum, F-I-B-E-R-F-O-U-R-U-M. You can use that for Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever you'd like. So with that said, uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Greg Whelan. Greg is a, um, he has over 20 years of, of high-tech marketing experience, including roles at Cisco and analog devices. Greg helped create the first DSL standards. He holds an MBA from Northeastern University, a bachelor's in electrical engineering from Cornell, and lives here in Newburyport. Some of the organizations I've worked in telecom, you know, he's mentioned 20 years of high tech, it's 20 years of telecom and 20 years of broadband. So, um, some of the guys, you know, mentioned analog devices, uh, we did a broadband, one of the, the first ADSL chipset. Um, the first standard was part of TIA, which is also part of ATIS, and they all have to tell it. Telecom is a great acronym in the late in industry. Uh, Broadband Forum is a global forum. I was one of the founders there. ITU is the big standards group that does international standards. So to, a lot of these, like T1E1.4, we did the uh, T1413, which was the first DSL standard, and then you bring it to the ITU for globalization. That's sort of how it works. Um, so work at MIT. Not, I took a course there at the Media Lab, but I, it's, the Unifications uh, Forum is actually more interesting. Combines actually, it is sort of worth mentioning it. It's Sloan, CSAIL, which is the Artificial Intelligence Lab, and the Media Lab. So it's a neat little group that focuses on, on sort of the big picture. So I don't know what you guys, your background is. I know some people are involved in, in telecom and broadband, maybe not. So I actually did this for another presentation, and I thought it was pretty cool. It's a really simple view, or I used to call it a wicked simple view. Um, so you are here. That is your house, right? And simply put, this is what the telecom network looks like, right? The pipes get, you get a lot of, you know, millions of homes and it aggregates, and you get bigger stuff. Um, so we, we all hear about the cloud. Um, I hear about it, I don't know, 50 to 100 times a day. Um, and basically that's sort of nebulous. It basically is a server farm hanging off a core network area. So broadband a lot of times means what they call the last mile two, three miles, whatever. So you'll, you'll hear the term a lot in telecom called the last mile. So that's from the CEO. I have some simple diagrams later. So that would be your, your central office. And then it, it gets aggregated to uh, various terms, but the, the metro network. So the metro connects, and that is relevant. I'm gonna come back to that for the further discussions. Um, we're actually served in Newburyport out of Lawrence. Um, I got a tour of that CEO years ago. They have 80,000 copper pairs coming into the building. So you look at one copper pier, it's this big. Picture 80,000 of them. Um, I saw one in, Ken in uh, Harvard Square, it had 110,000 copper pairs. So it's just, you know, just the scale of these things. Um, and then you aggregate to more of a core switching center, maybe Boston for some things, probably New York. The big core in the US, like Herna, Virginia. It's like, 
ninety percent of the traffic in the u s goes through new york herndon virginia silicon valley there's a few places that are where the core so if you have like your we have a local business and a website rebo uh... your server is not in your house uh... it's probably in atlanta right and the interesting thing is when you send an email to your neighbor that email goes all the way to salt lake city and back it doesn't loop back at any point other than that so that's just a simple way of looking at a network um, so let's look at Newburyport. Um, what are your options? I already mentioned some. You get Verizon, uh, DSL, phone over copper pair. Um, that's Green Street. Um, I don't know if you know where the CO is. CO's are great because they're, they're 100 year old buildings. Usually they're in the city centers across the United States, roughly 20,000 of them. Great real estate play once they figure that out. Um, you can always sell a CO. It's usually a, a building in the center of a city with no windows. Um, and so that's using the copper, right? I, I live in the south end, so I have DSL, you're like biased. Um, and so it's a straight, it's, the standard for DSL is 18,000 feet. But that's not radial feet, that's copper that's going up and down and you know, twisting around and all that stuff. So then we have Comcast. The head end, as you know, is off Hale Street. <coughs> and then they have a, I think they have another slide coming up. It does basically the, the options in Newburyport today. And there are other ones uh, more, there's uh, people talk about doing a uh, broadband over power lines, actually standards on that, uh, never really took off for a, a lot of reasons. Um, wireless, there's cell towers, there's actually a lot of cell towers now, but um, you know, the state police, I don't know if you've noticed it, I'm sort of a telco geek, so I noticed that over the last six to nine months there's been more uh, radio heads on the antenna, I don't know if you noticed that. Um, so you'll see that because obviously mobile with LTE, which is 4G, which is the fastest stuff, um, people deploying that, and it's everything's about coverage and capacity. So you have more spectrum, you need more radios, those little silver things in the, in the pole. So you're starting to get, this one in Wilmington, they must have three dozen radio heads on it, right off the highway. Um, so, so that's, you know, you could, in theory, data caps aside, take your cell phone, put it into a Wi-Fi hotspot mode, and use Wi-Fi in your house and not pay for anything else. If you didn't have a data cap, you could do that, or you could pay, but it is an option. As LTE and in 2020 beyond with 5G, you're gonna get more bandwidth over wireless, so also the wireline guys um, you know, need to keep up. So one of the things you have to, when you think of the telecom, and I use cable telecom you know, synonymously, I deal with everyone. Um, it's a brutally competitive business. It really is, other than Newberry Port, because we have a monopoly in Comcast. Um, the rest of the world, you could do satellite broadband. Uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about uh, real quick, uh, I don't have a timer, where is our, I'm going to get one, 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 minute, one minute. Well, I'm going to need more than that. Um, so anyway, last mile. So we talked about that, Comcast head end, coax, people getting to the, you know, fiber, when it's fiber, fiber, fiber. Uh, Verizon's all copper. Uh, with Comcast is a coax, what they call HFC, hybrid fiber coax, which is fiber to a node and then the existing coax. Um, uh, you know, why not fiber? Well, you mentioned cable does have some fiber. Um, the back end is all fiber, the back hall, as they call it. Um, if Fios is a fiber to the home, it's called a PON, passive optical network, tree and branch, blah, 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 blah right? Um, so that, that's an option. There's other fiber, FTTX, you know, fiber to the pedestal, those green boxes, fiber to the curb. So there's various fiber, it's the electronics that have to get lit up along the way that is the economics that are involved. My favorite one is FTTR, which is fiber to the rich. Um, uh, we don't have to talk about in the home, but basically the interesting thing that people hear over the top, is that a term you ever hear? Everyone knows Netflix, that's over the top. Um, so you can basically do everything with broadband. People are calling it cord cutting, where they don't pay Comcast for TV anymore, they just pay for broadband and do everything over the top. Uh, Wino Files in uh, Newburyport, West Newbury has it, Massachusetts town by town franchising. Every town in Massachusetts, quick pro quo, yeah, we'll let you do, we'll let you do files, but I want a new fire truck. Uh, Verizon finally said, very politely, of course, uh, screw you, um, we're going to go to the states that have statewide franchising, such as Texas. There's tons of files in Texas. Um, in Newburyport, as I, as, oops, 
it was mentioned it's, it's ideal for files, not counting Plum Island, which was an issue. Why would they run fiber at 30,000 bucks a mile, pass all those home in Newbury and you can't serve them, right? So great area wiring, high density, affluent community. It's an ideal community for files. Um, it's gonna be talking about regional broadband, I believe. Um, what that is, it would be this, covering sort of the, connecting the, the bigger city pops, the Lawrence is Lowell, you know, Gloucester, th that town. I, okay. Um, and you hear about municipal broadband, which would be focused on there in the last mile. Uh, bah, 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 city metro. Uh, it's expensive. Everything, you know, it's, it sounds free. It's not. It's expensive. Back home, whatever you don't own, you get a wholesale, and that's expensive. There's a lot of regulatory and legal issues, municipal Wi Fi. Um, I don't want, um, just some quick things from my experience, what I do every day is the big thing in suburban and urban broadband is get a gigabit to every home. I already mentioned that. So that is a big trend in the nation. Um, and I mentioned the different fiber deployment. Rural broadband is literally get them off a uh, dial-up. 30% of the Massachusetts um, is still on dial-up, or 5% in New Hampshire. So there's a lot of people who don't have a broadband option. So that's FCC's trying to get money. AT&T and Verizon, by the way, gave money back. Thank you for the money, FCC, to do rural broadband. It doesn't work in our business model. Here's your money back. How often does that happen? It's very expensive to serve rural communities. Uh, I mentioned everything over the top. Wi-Fi is huge, as you know, but it's becoming more and more strategic to the SP. I mentioned mobile cellular, blah, blah, blah. Virtualization, I won't go into, but I hear cloud 50 times a day. I hear virtualization 300 times a day. It's the big trend of the industry. Final comments, net neutrality sucks. Um, oops, did I say that? It's bad. Um, it's bad for consumers. It's counterintuitive. Oh, open internet. It's, you know, my tagline, Title II, which people talk about regulating broadband, you will kill gigabit. You will take the incentive away. You'll never get gigabit if you regulate broadband. Uh, government shouldn't mandate deployment. Competition is good. Fear of competition is good enough. Uh, I'm not a big fan of cities getting into the broadband business. I don't want them spending my taxpayer, my money, to, to compete with private industry. I think that's wrong. And don't underestimate what it takes to deploy these solutions. Um, I drew nice little lines and nice little circles. It's tough, okay? The best line I ever heard about uh, last mile, it sounds easy, it's only a mile, but the problem is there's tons of them. And you look at the, it's the scaling issue. You got trucks, cherry pickers, tower, backhoes, manholes, labor unions, vandals, local regulations. So the last mile, oh, it's only a mile. But this is a quote that I thought was really sort of nailed it as far as the challenge of doing this stuff. It's not as easy as it sounds. And by the way, Verizon and AT&T spend about 20 billion a year doing this stuff. Each, and Comcast is another, you know, 15 billion. That's it. That's my high speed one-on-one overview. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Greg. I'd um, now like to introduce uh, Lenny Mira. Uh, Lenny Mira is a state representative for the 2nd Essex District, comprising Georgetown, Groveland, Merrimack, Newbury, West Newbury, and sections of Boxford and Haverhill. He owns his uh, family construction company that digs ditches and installs wiring for Comcast and Verizon. He holds a degree in speech communications from Boston College and lives in West Newbury. Lenny. Uh, thank you, Ari. Um, Thank you for putting this together, Ari, and thank you all for coming out here. Uh, as Ari said, I'm a vice president at Mirror Company. Uh, we're a family-owned construction company. Been in business since 1953, and we've specialized in underground utilities for most of those years. Now we've expanded. We do overhead utility construction as well. We do a lot of the construction that Mr. Whalen was just describing. And I, I can't emphasize enough what he's saying about how expensive it is. There's no cheap way to install a, uh, a network of this type. Uh, Google is picking just a few select cities when they do it, and um, the reasons are very apparent when you start looking into the details about what's involved uh, to get something like this done. Uh, they have a giant checklist, it's this big, and it's, it's, it's very detailed, but there are three basic things that, for instance, Google looks for in a city or town uh, when they go in. Uh, number one, a city or town would have to provide information about existing infrastructure. Um, they're asking cities to provide accurate information about local infrastructure like utility poles, uh, conduit, and other existing utilities in the ground like water, sewer, electricity. Uh, the second thing they're going to be looking for is access to this existing infrastructure. Um, they would be asking cities to ensure that they and other providers can access and lease existing infrastructure. Uh, it would be very wasteful and disruptive to uh, 
duplicate utility poles or to dig up streets unnecessarily. So it's, it's enormously expensive. They would have avoided that at all costs if they could. And the last thing that uh, they would be looking for is to help make construction speedy and predictable. Okay, they're asking cities and towns to make sure they have efficient and predictable permit and construction processes. Um, at Mirror Company, we have about 150 people in payroll, we put out over 30 crews a day, and we have people that work full time doing nothing but getting permits for each job. And every little dig up we do requires a separate permit. So if there's three things that had to be fixed in the report, I'd have to send my guy to City Hall three separate times, pay the fee three separate times. Uh, these are the kinds of things that will have to get streamlined if we want to get a system like this implemented. And this is where all of you come in. I want to make sure uh, Ari gets your names and emails because uh, my other job at Ari, as Ari uh, explained is I'm a state representative. I'm newly elected. One of the first things I've learned is that uh, elected officials are very responsive to constituents when they start getting phone calls and emails. Now maybe two or three calls and emails may not make them judge, but you know what? If they get 103 emails on something like this, they're going to notice. And this is what we're really going to have to really put our heads around and work together on. Uh, once we get this rolling, once we get organized, uh, we're going to have to contact our elected officials. We're going to tell them, we want this high-speed internet. This is going to help us all. It's a win-win for everybody. Uh, it's not just a win for the internet provider. It's not just a win for Google if they get it. It's a win for businesses that can operate here. We have an industrial park here in Newburyport that I think has too many empty buildings. I think we need more companies in there doing the, the work of the next century, not the last century. That's going to require this high-speed broadband internet. And it also helps consumers. Uh, I can't say enough about what Mr. Whalen said about competition. Nothing keeps corporate greed in check like competition. Nothing else even comes close. Nothing we do in government will do that. Only competition. When you, the consumer, have choice, that is what drives prices down and quality up. And we all want this. It helps us all. It's a win-win for everybody. And it's a win for the city. Um, a place like Newbury Port's full of um, highly intelligent, highly educated, um, high-income people that will benefit from this. And it's something that the city will benefit as well in turn. So, um, like I said, make sure Ari has your name, has your email, and at some point uh, we're going to have to organize around this and um, notify our elected officials at both the city and state level. Uh, just to give a quick story, when I first got elected, I got uh, over 100 emails on two subjects, uh, dogs and guns. Dogs <laughs> and guns. Uh, people that own dogs and people that own guns are not only passionate about what they do, they're organized. And I got emails, phone calls, letters, everything. I got personal visits saying, don't you pass, I don't want to see any laws passed on breed specific dogs because apparently someone was talking about <laughs> out long, I don't know, pit bulls or Rottweilers. And dog owners got together, even the ones that only own poodles, got together and said, we don't want to see breed specific laws on books. Same thing with the gun owners. They're very well organized. Well, this is something that unites us all. It's something that benefits us all. So thank you all for coming out and uh, thank you again, Ari, for putting this together. Thank you, Representative Mira. So we're talking about broadband. Um, let's talk about regional broadband. Um, I'd like to introduce our, our keynote speaker. Um, Dan Vortherm is uh, someone who, when I was kind of as a backdrop, back in February, what, eight, nine months ago, I organized a forum similar to this, kind of more of a brainstorming session. We did the New Report Public Library. I wrote a letter to the editor of the paper inviting interested residents, readers of the paper, to come to the library and learn about broadband and talk about how can we get something that's better than the status quo into our homes and businesses. Approximately 30 people showed up, residents of New Report, Newbury, West Newbury, Amesbury, Merrimack, and um, I thought we had a very productive uh, conversation. Um, when the conversation came up, and I was talking to Karen Spencer, who uh, uh, I'll talk about later today, but um, when I was talking to Karen about, well, when we do a sequel, you know, after February, when we do a sequel later this year, what type of people should we have at this event? And Karen and I agreed that it made sense for someone to be represented who either from Cape Cod, from the Open Cape Network, or from Maine, 
from the three ring binder network, or possibly even from the Berkshires, which is building up today a much faster network than we have today. Um, so Dan's name was on a very short list, and I'm glad that he was uh, willing to come up. Uh, Dan Vortherm, I have here, is the Chief Executive Officer of Open Cape Corporation, a role he's held for two years. Open Cape is a nonprofit organization that built over 300 miles of fiber stretching from Provincetown to Providence and uh, also, I believe, with connections to Brockton and Boston. Um, he has uh, many years of experience in uh, many roles working with many firms. Um, the piece that I want to pay attention to, he also is a, a U.S. Navy veteran, spent over 10 years working with the Navy. He holds degrees from the U.S. Naval Academy, George Washington University, and an MBA from the University of Denver. If we could turn it over to Dan. In addition to that background, uh, I will also add that uh, I took the job two years ago taking over from a gentleman named Dan Gallagher who deserves a lot of the kudos for putting Open Cape together in the first place, putting the teams together that provided that local voice. Uh, and I'll get into a little bit of that in, the, in, the, in a moment. Um, I will say that when Ari first invited me up here, I thought it was a panel. and I've been on panels before. I obviously wasn't paying enough attention because suddenly I'm the keynote speaker. <laughs> and I'm working on about three hours of sleep because unfortunately my wife's been sick the last five days and it's been interesting. So hopefully I'll be coherent and make some sense. So ask questions at any point in time for me. Uh, I did come here from Denver after being involved in venture capital funded startups out there in the telecom and internet space. So I kind of have a little bit of an outside view sometimes. I have lived up and down the East Coast before. Uh, moved to Colorado twice, Nebraska, South Dakota, Connecticut a couple of places, Virginia, Maryland, South Carolina, Florida. So the East Coast isn't foreign to me. Uh, my wife and I always thought we wanted to get back closer to big water. Uh, I did spend a total of 30 years in the Navy, active in reserve. Uh, we never anticipated to be surrounded by water on the Cape or this far north, but it's been a great experience for us so far. Uh, I can't, uh, even though I'm the keynote, I can't say that I'm the expert on what should happen up here. So I really thought I'd just go through some of the points on how Open Cape got started, what we delivered, and then some ideas for resources that you might consider as you look forward uh, to doing something up here with a fiber plant, be it Nonprofit, municipal, for profit, you know, whatever the case may be. I think there's some interesting resources available on the municipal side, and it really has been the seed of getting Open Cape started. Uh, in the origins of Open Cape, you know, we did start very much with these types of forums. And, and I say we, I wasn't here, of course, because it started back in 2005, 2006, when Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution couldn't get a second connection. Because of their connections around the world, they were seeing what they were paying for broadband prices and were getting ripped off by the incumbent. Verizon basically abandoned the entire Cape, and there had been some stories about Verizon kind of on the side to Open Cape, hey, would you be interested in buying our copper plant on the Cape? Well, nobody was ever going to do that, but that kind of shows what Verizon was doing for investments in the area. So it was really Dan Gallagher from the Cape Cod Community College, uh, my current chairman, Art Gaylord from Woods Hole, who got together, started talking to some of the towns, and some of the towns in the Outer Cape area were without telephone service, including 911 for days back then because of the age of the infrastructure and the impact of some of the storms. So basically four people got together and said, let's start having forums like this. Uh, I think Dan Gallagher was a great organizer. I think the first forum down at Woods Hole gathered somewhere between three and 400 people. There was that much of an interest in doing something on the Cape. So this is the right starting point, I think, for getting a, a municipal network or a local network or a fiber network of, of any legal structure in place. It really does have to come from this kind of an environment. 
what we were able to set up, oh, sorry, being a nonprofit, we have to have a mission statement. So we have a very broad mission statement about bringing broadband uh, to the communities, supporting anything that needs broadband, basically. Uh, we were you know, focused on getting the middle mile network up in place, but before the stimulus money was available, the plan was a microwave network. Have at least one microwave connection in every town, and there's 15 towns in the Cape, uh, including getting a connection on the other side of the canal in case both bridges fell down or something. Uh, so that was really the origins before the money you know, became available. They thought they could get the towns to kick in a little bit and build a microwave network and at least have some level of connectivity above what was available from you know, Verizon on the uh, data side and have a separate network from uh, the Comcast network. Uh, it does include uh, connections into Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, which I'll get into in a minute as well. The background is, as Ari said, we are a 501c3. That structure was specifically on purpose. We've had discussions with the uh, you know, board about becoming a for-profit or whatever, but uh, we really wanted to have that local community asset. We never wanted to become the next Verizon, the next Comcast, and treat people the same way that the incumbents tend to treat people, especially when there's no competition out there. Uh, we've got the uh, volunteer board of directors, uh, and they are people that live in the communities. Like I said, Art's my chairman down at Woods Hole. He runs all the scientific computing systems there. Um, we've got retired uh, executives. We've got government officials. We've got people from educational environment. We've got people off Cape as well, because when you see our network map, if you haven't seen it before, we do have more fiber off Cape than on Cape. Uh, what we're able to put together was really, I think, good timing, fortuitous timing with the stimulus package coming online. So we had 32 million federal grant money, 5 million from the state, uh, 2 million in-kind cash match, uh, which was you know, another private grant. And then the in-kind, which you could contribute as part of your match for the federal government came from uh, working with the county and just volunteer time with our board of directors, a bunch of free legal help to begin with. So that really is how we put together $40 million. Uh, a key aspect of that was the first 50,000 from an EDC grant to get it started, get some of the uh, studies in place. I did want to talk a little bit about our community environment. I don't have any slides on that, but I put this in there just as a placeholder for my own memory here. We got a lot of flack, a couple of uh, FOIA requests because of the federal money. Why did Cape Cod need grant money? Because Cape Cod is home of the rich and famous. It's where everybody goes to vacation. It's where everybody has a second home. Some towns down there, 80% of the homes are second homes for people. And that really tells you why we need it right there. Because it's the local population that works in the hospitality industry that has part-time employment, part-year employment. It is the lower paying jobs. So the incumbents were never going to put the money into it. And that was really a critical aspect of it. I've got fiber on poles that were set in the 1930s. And nobody claims ownership of those because nobody wants to go replace them when they fall down in a storm. So I'm going to have to get into the pole ownership business here pretty soon, too. Uh, in addition to the 11,400 poles I have from the utility companies. All the discussion about how hard it is to put a, pole, uh, put a network like this up. Yeah, you've got poles here with aerial fiber on it, but start dealing with the utility companies in addition to, you know, all the regulatory aspects that you have to go through. That's a fun environment. Our initial project was to build out to 72 community anchor institutions. So that's libraries, schools, government buildings. Our model was to build out to at least two locations in every town with the notion that the town had some type of an INET or local network behind that. So they could still connect all their town buildings together and we could get them at least two connections out to the internet and out to uh, shared services in our data center. We also planned on building microwave as a backup in the outer Cape area. It's so narrow, trying to put two fiber cables didn't make any sense. If a big storm came through, it would take them both out, so we've got microwave. And then there was also the thought process of having microwave down the main part of the Cape. Early in the project, we had 700 megahertz public safety radios in our project, but then with the first net federal legislation, uh, we were unable to spend that money, but we still built uh, portions of the microwave network so that if FirstNet did get deployed through the state, we'd have some places that had fiber 
and microwave, so we had you know multiple connection points to support public safety. Again, given the exposed nature of the Cape to the storms, uh, it was an important aspect of the project from the public safety perspective. Uh, on the 72 CAIs, you see here the, uh, the collection of uh, types of organizations. Early on, and again, this preceded me, so this is kind of a secondhand story, but a lot of the focus from NTIA in the first round of grants was on digital divide. So there's a lot of focus on the libraries. The libraries are a very busy operation on the Cape, and there's you know 30 libraries there, including the community college library that we built fiber to. Um, what we were able to do with the uh, grant money was actually put in over 450 miles of fiber into the entire network. Not all of that is new fiber, and I'll get to that in a minute. But we were also able to connect 96 locations, not just 72 locations. We were able to really focus on a lot more of the public safety environments, and so we couldn't deliver them the uh, 700 megahertz solution that they were looking for. And we did this within the grant structure we had. No additional cost to the federal government. So it was really a, a good story of how the project was managed. All the control processes set up by Dan Gallagher before I got there. I just had to follow through. Um, but it's, it, I think it's really a, a, a success story. It does cost money to do this, but if you plan it, program it right, you can, you can over deliver. And there was no reserve money to you know, say, oh, what if we ran over here? If we did run over in some area, we had to find money to cover it in other places. Uh, our network map is probably a little different than what you've seen before if you're familiar with the Open Cape network. We've got, in most places in our, in our backbone network, we have 144 strands of fiber. Um, in the, some of the areas, like in the Canal area, in Hyannis area, because they're kind of connectors between rings, we actually have 288 strands of fiber. Going out to the Outer Cape, we've got 72 strands, and we're thinking that's not enough even for the Outer Cape area. We do connect into Providence and Brockton with the fiber we built. We have to connect to some aspect. We got a lot of questions from people on the Cape. Why do you have any fiber off the Cape? This is supposed to be a Cape-focused project. Well, we still have to connect it to the rest of the world. Um, you know, we're a middle mile network. We have to connect to somebody who's that first mile to get to the internet. So those are the connections we have. We also, between us and CapeNet, and I'll explain CapeNet in a little bit, we both have connections from Providence up to Brockton up into Boston. So that's important from the government perspective. If you're trying to do anything with the state, connecting up into the state networks, getting up to Boston is a critical aspect. It also supports commercial aspects because we actually have partners down in our area who are building data center disaster recovery services, disaster recovery seats environment, and office for somebody to go to if they can't get to their office in Boston. So they're really targeting the financial institution, so having that connection to Boston is extremely important. We also added another connection across the middle of our network here, so we've got some rings off Cape from a reliability perspective in the network. Uh, some of this is through you know, fiber relationships with other people, not fiber that we own, but it still counts in, in terms of the overall network. Um, Martha's Vineyard has a microwave connection at 1.2 gigabits per second. Trying to build fiber to Martha's Vineyard within the time constraints and the, the financial constraints of the, of the BTOP grant process just wasn't going to work. They weren't terribly happy. They wanted fiber. They put their own BTOP uh, application into the second round and didn't get uh, approved. Um, there's actually some fiber to Martha's Vineyard I'm going to try to abscond with uh, if I can work the deal right. Uh, but. You'll see in our, in our microwave network, we do have a hole. We had a problem with one water tank getting on it, uh, some political issues with a certain law enforcement agency. So we're still working to, to finish off the microwave network and really be able to have a backbone of microwave through the, the whole network. Just because I am an engineer, I gotta throw out some numbers. Um, from our data center in Barnstable out to Brockton, we have a 100 gigabit per second link running today. That's the current technology that's available in most fiber networks. If you read the news in, in the telecom industry, major telecom providers are still upgrading to 100 gig, and we had it, because it's a new network, building it at 100 gig. We also run 100 gig from a central office location uh, in north of Falmouth, 
uh, out to Providence. Those are our two you know, high-speed backbone connections. The ring on the Cape runs at 40 gigabits per second. The backbone connection out to Provi uh, Provincetown runs at 20 gigabits per second. And these are all on a pair of fibers. In our data center, we have 288 strands of fiber coming in from two different directions. Eight pair of fibers are in use today. Some of them are allocated to the state, some additional ones are allocated to the utility company, but for our own network, we're using eight fibers. And we've got 288 coming into that data center today, so capacity is never gonna be an issue. Electronics will always be upgraded, speeds will continue to increase. Um, again, when you start doing something on your own, the incumbent's gonna start throwing out all the uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt factors and say this is gonna be obsolete by the time you build it, but uh, it's, it's just not true. Uh, in our data center, we have roughly 200, or sorry, 2,500 square feet of space. It was an existing building that had been abandoned except for the uh, Sheriff's Department radio room that was in the building. It was a former Sheriff's Department dispatch center and they moved over to the uh, military base in Bourne. Uh, so we came in, put a couple million dollars into refurbish the building, make it habitable again for us. County GIS is in the building. Uh, conference room space uh, that the county was sorely lacking. Um, and then we put another million and a half into the data center equipment. So we've got a facility now, Mid-Cape, that can also support things like the multi-agency coordination center that they spin up every time there's some type of a snowstorm or major hurricane event. Uh, with the backup power generator there, with our current load, we could probably run several weeks without needing to refueling. We do have co-location space in there, plus, I gotta say it, our cloud service. We do have a virtual machine environment in there. Uh, currently, the, the county is a, is a good customer in the data center, and we're spinning up some commercial uh, virtual machines for people to start testing. And it's, it's a nice environment for the small businesses, but it's really a nice environment for the towns. Consider Provincetown. I don't know if you've been out there before. Elevation of Town Hall is about four feet above sea level. They don't have a data center. Their servers are under a stairwell somewhere. So being able to back up those services or run those applications in our data center is really gonna be an increase in reliability of government services across the board. Uh, I always have to show this picture. Uh, you can't see our generator now because of the six foot privacy fence we had to put up for the Old Kings Highway Historical Society. It slides more of a good play um, locally than up here probably, but there is a Problem with uh, cost-effective housing on the Cape, so I think we could also put a family of four in our generator enclosure. <laughs> uh, I think it's important to note our operational structure. It's a real confusing factor because of the similarity of names. In the original grant application, RCN Metro was chosen as the fiber partner. So they were going to do the construction and operate the network. When it came time for looking at the federal acquisition regulations when the grant was awarded, they realized you can't just pick your partner and give them, you know, 24, 26 million construction money. They could have, I think, in making them a subrecipient of the grant, but then you lose some control and whatever, but ended up going out and having to RFP that build and operate piece. So, CapeNet won that uh, RFP. You know, just totally competitive bidding process. Uh, RCN Metro, which became Sidera, which got bought by Light Tower, I think. You know, they submitted a bid. Uh, Cape Net was formed specifically to support this project. Zeo, which is a big national fiber provider, they put in a bid. So it was a well-publicized RFP, and Cape Net won that. So they're our network operator. Somebody hits a pole, Cape Net has to respond. Now, we're on the Cape with... Uh, you know, myself and one other employee who's a longtime Verizon fiber guy, so we usually respond faster than CapeNet to go see what the issue is. Um, but they are our network operator. We retain full ownership of the network, lock, stock, and barrel. CapeNet just pays us for the privilege of operating and selling services on it. So for all the towns and the libraries, CapeNet is the service provider on our fiber. And then, you know, with their fiber rights, they can sell to commercial entities, they can build additional laterals off of it, et cetera. Um, it is a federal mandate that it's an open access network. So 
it's a little bit different perspective than you know the total open uh, network requirements of the FCC. What this means is that if Comcast came to us and said, I want to buy services or buy fiber on the network, you know, we wouldn't sell it, but we do a, a lease of the dark fiber to them. We can't tell them no. We price it commercially and, you know, being uh, in need of cash to maintain the network for both us and CapeNet, you know, we, we'd be competitive on pricing, um, but it's all negotiated, you know, price points, but we can't tell anybody no. And we do have some real hard restrictions on CapeNet to make sure that they can't monopolize the fiber. They have to offer lit services on a certain percentage, and on almost twice that, they have to provide the fiber as dark fiber to somebody who wanted to come in and be another operator of any type on the network where they needed direct fiber access. The data center operational structure was planned to be the same, issued a design-build operate uh, contract, and nobody bid on it. They revised the RFP, issued it again, and nobody bid on it. So then we uh, went to the state contract, Dan Gallagher, having come out of the college, said, okay, I go to the state contract now. We're not a state entity, but uh, convinced IBM to come in and do the uh, design of the data center, and then a follow-on contract to build out the data center. Uh, for 2,500 square feet in, in Barnstable, they weren't interested in operating it. You know, had it been 120,000 square feet somewhere, maybe they would have been, but we now run our own data center, and we're doing that with uh, some key partners that we've been able to bring in. I actually get free monitoring of our cloud service just for having bought the hardware from a particular company, and they're taking all, over all of my 7x24 infrastructure monitoring. So those type of relationships that you can build with local companies can really stretch the dollar quite a bit. I didn't mention it before, but Open Cape is three full-time and one part-time employees. And we operate the data center today with just that number of people with the additional help we have. And we're supposed to only be two full-time and, and one part-time by original plan, so uh, we've been able to keep an extra person on. Uh, the real result, I think, to, to point out is the fact that it is a locally owned and controlled network. We're here for the good of the communities. Revenue and excess of operating expenses and required reserves will go back to the communities. How we do that, you know, will depend on what those revenues are and the board will come up with some, you know, idea for that, whether it's additional network builds, whether it's uh, contributions to the schools. But that's an advantage, I think, of, of that type of structure. Uh, again, specifically because we didn't want to become the next Comcast or, or Verizon and, and just ignore what the customers really need. We're here for the good of the communities that we serve. It doesn't rule out for-profit subsidiaries, though. There's a lot of nonprofits that have had for-profit subsidiaries, so it's a way to bring in other capital, support other services, uh, the last mile piece of it. You know, we're a middle mile network, so we're that square block on the previous diagram from Greg, and we don't have the last mile connections into residences, uh, you know, residential service. Um, we get a call a week at least for people looking for an alternative to Comcast. But there's, there's a number of things we're looking at right now in that for-profit subsidiary environment that could be quite interesting, especially in some healthcare services that we could provide. Another key aspect, given the 15 towns on the Cape and the support that all the towns gave to the project, we conceived this regional area network concept as a service offering on top of the fiber. And uh, Barnstable County did an RFP process because they wanted to be the procurement agent for it. You have to do an RFP, so we responded, Comcast responded, and there's just no way Comcast could have met the requirements. We connect every CAI location with a gig connection. They don't necessarily buy a gig of service, but they're connected with a gig connection, so it can be turned up in about a five-minute configuration change to a gig if they wanted it. Brewster's Ladies Library that's open about 20 hours a week in the winter has a gig connection. But through this network, because of the architecture, we can do direct layer two connections, and sorry if this is more technical, but we can make multiple buildings in a town connect like they're on the same local area network. Like one computer in your house to the next computer in your house. We can also do that town to town. And that's really important on the, uh, the school environment. There's a big STEM push with the community college taking the lead. 
So now that shared environment in the educational field where you can push classrooms out there and not have to worry about the traffic leaving on a, on a cable connection that goes out to Brockton and then comes back to the next town where you've got latency issues and you know just overall performance issues. So the architecture really supports this notion of regional umbrella services that the county's pushing, e-permitting applications, consolidated voice over IP. The town of Falmouth has 14 different key systems and PBX systems in their town. 14. Not very reliable, not very cost effective, but that regionalization of services that the county's taking the lead on, and then we're coordinating with them on what data center services we offer. So it's really an opportunity for the towns to collaborate and cut costs. But it's really that architecture of the network that allows it to happen. On the economic development front, I think there has been an opportunity to retain a couple of uh, critical companies with the uh, broadband fiber. Uh, there's one in particular that's building a second building down in Falmouth. It's a technology spinoff that came out of uh, Woods Hole. So keeping those jobs there has been important. More importantly on the Cape, you know, given the Cape environment, land use is a, is a big issue. There's not any type of coordinated sewage treatment. So really doing a major development, you know, everybody's still on a 1940s to 1960s septic system. So doing a major development effort on the Cape is very challenging from the environmental <coughs> perspective. But because of the fiber being available, we've been able to get some of the thresholds increased in certain of the industrial parks so that they don't require that massive detailed review of the Cape Cod Commission. And the Cape Cod Commission are the guys that raised it. But because of the opportunity that the fiber prevent, uh, presents to really develop those industrial parks, bring in that knowledge base of, of companies that we would like to. Uh, there's a couple of other people who have come in just recently looking at this joint workspace environment. A lot of people work from home, have connect connectivity issues, have attention issues. I've worked from home before. And, had to train my wife when I was in my basement office, I was at work, and when I was up in the kitchen, then I was taking a coffee break, and then she could talk to me. But those shared workspace environments, again, high bandwidth requirements really facilitate that, because you're also gonna get into video conferencing, certainly voice over IP. So there's a couple of developers that have come in and we work very closely with them to say, okay, if you're looking at this building, here's what it looks like relative to our network. How far is it? What would it cost to bring a lateral to it? What services can we provide there? How does that relate to our services available in the data center? Um, there's a great incubator environment that's really started by the Chamber of Commerce. We're not quite physically connected to it yet, but it's a support environment where uh, if somebody needs some um, server space, if they're developing code or whatever, you know, we'll, we'll spin up a virtual machine for them and say, here, have at it. There's a startup weekend that's held twice a, twice a year. And it is a weekend. It starts at 6.30 on a Friday. And it's been known to go throughout the night and end sometime on Sunday. So really, you know, trying to find those uh, startup environments on the Cape. And it's really a, a you know, group coordination effort that, that brings that about. Uh, we do have a lot of partnerships, and I'll get into some of those in a minute, with youth retention. A lot of 20 and 30 year olds leave the Cape because there's no jobs for them, there's no upward mobility, there's a lot of lifestyle businesses. I just want to be in business because I don't want to be fully retired, uh, so I only want one or two employees. So there's a real problem on the Cape for that. And really trying to work and say, what can we do to you know, keep those young people uh, on the Cape? Uh, I'm probably preaching to the choir in terms of the need for fiber, but just a few slides I pulled out here and. I think I'm getting close to my half hour, so I'll spin through them here quick. This is, you know, overall economic development view from the perspective of fiber speeds. You know, the U.S. ranks 14th uh, in the world. South Korea is up at the top. Japan is up in here. Switzerland. Why Hong Kong is on there separate, I don't know. But I'm the first guy to start poo-pooing some of these things. Because if you look at Japan, it's about half the U.S. population in 1 25th of the physical area when compared to the US. But the real problem from lack of competition is shown in a slide like this. Just with disposable income, what an average you know, price per month is. Looking at Seoul versus San Francisco. 
you know, San Francisco, near Silicon Valley. That price comparison is astounding to me. My own personal view, I moved here from Denver. I had Comcast uh, as my internet and cable provider in Denver. When I moved here, my price was one third higher and my bandwidth was one half of what I had in Denver because there was competition in Denver. Yeah, it was DSL, but it was also Quest that had just been acquired or about to be acquired by CenturyLink and CenturyLink had IPTV services in other parts of the state. So there's really that drive once you've got two competitors in the marketplace to push it down. Now that's not always the case. I'm working with a potential customer right now. They have a backhaul connection from one uh, cable company. They went to another cable company and said, can you build a second connection in for a redundant <coughs> connection? And the second cable company said, no, we don't want to build across the state line into their territory. So e even if there is some competition possible, there's a little bit of, I'll say collusion, I'm not trying to accuse anybody of violating antitrust laws, but you just kind of look at it in face value and say these guys don't want to compete with each other. Uh, if you haven't read Susan Crawford's book, it's, it's a great read. Video rates. I'm not sure if I'll ever like 3D TV myself, but uh, just looking at some of the 2D ultra specs that are coming out, this is logarithmic scale on this slide, so. More bandwidth is always going to be required as technology progresses. And there's the changing uh, landscape of video. Greg talked about some of the over-the-top services, Hulu, Netflix, whatever, but here's some recent announcements that Verizon is even looking at launching an internet-based service. Not just Fios, but just an over-the-top service. Aereo, which got shot down in the Supreme Court for providing local TV stations over the internet, is looking to become a, a PACE TV provider so that they can get the, the content they need. So now you can get local channels over the internet. You know, we can't get real over-the-air signals down on the Cape, even though, you know, you can buy the extra antenna, but you really, it doesn't work well. Uh, and HBO, I mean, the dates on these announcements are all just in the last month. So the whole landscape is changing here. Why? I wish I was a Netflix uh, stock owner. This is an estimate from 2012. If you talk to the incumbents or if you read you know, the responses to Google Fiber and stuff, they say nobody needs a gig. <laughs> well, I think that's wrong, but if you take a look at these projections of what the average bandwidth will be, I think most of these have been um, you know, somewhat pessimistic even. But if you're not building a network now, and it's showing that you need a gig in 2020, you're not going to get there. You're always going to be behind. So now's the time to be looking at a fiber-based network. Uh, quickly, some resources available. You can read, you know, all sorts of things about how to build your own network, but there's some really good organizations to help. Um, if there's particular issues, even the Baller Herbst Law Group will occasionally, you know, weigh in on a matter, not give you a full legal opinion without being paid for it, but they're very positive about local area networks, locally owned networks, especially municipal networks, so they, they can be an asset. And guys like us, you know, we're federally funded. Our financial reports went in every quarter, three reports every quarter for three and a half years. So you want to see what it costs to build our network. I'll, I'll send you what our budget was. Yeah, it'd take a little digestion, but all that information is available and people who are, you know, BTOP recipients and community-focused networks, everybody's more than willing to say, here's what we did, here's what the costs were, here's what worked, what didn't work. Uh, potential funding sources. Some of these projects are somewhat strange. The Rural Broadband Experiments Project the census tract that our office is in is Sandwich Town Line to Yarmouth Town Line, Route 6 North in that section of Barnstable. And it's got $34,000 a year support if you build out to the hard to reach town, uh, houses in that area. So some of them are very strange and very hard to use, but education, healthcare, uh, rural utility service, uh, some state money, I'd like, I'd like to get rounding error of what the state keeps giving to MBI. 
<laughs> they got another 50 million. Yes, they've got more unserved communities out there, but I'd like some of the rounding error going to you know some of the other communities. I was thinking of titling this slide, Misery Loves Company, but this is actually one of my favorite groups that we deal with on a regular basis, the Smarter Cake Partnership. It is not a legal organization in any way, shape, or form. It's a group of like-minded individuals that have gotten together, and next May we're putting on our fourth annual summit. And again, they've varied from, I think, a low of 200 people up to 400 people that have showed up to these things. The original partnership was the Chamber of Commerce, the Tech Council, Barnstable County EDC, which provided the first 50,000 to get Open Cape started with a feasibility study, uh, the Cape Cod Commission, and Open Cape. We since then added the Young Professionals and Builders Association, you know, looking at a broader sense of economic development. If you've got these types of organizations, that's what really can support, you know, getting a, a grassroots effort launched. And I do kind of put it into the category of misery loves company because everybody on there recognizes the, the need and recognize that the Cape didn't have that type of a broadband connection available to it. So it, it's amazed me. We meet every two weeks, almost like clockwork. Occasionally we miss one when too much is going on. But it's, it's purely a non-organization. We raise money through the uh, summits uh, we put on and we use the, uh, the county and the Chamber of Commerce for most of the, the manpower and a vehicle to run the money through, but this, it, it's a non-organization, but it meets every two weeks like clockwork. It's just that power of the local group. So that's really kind of what I wanted to leave you with. This, again, Misery Loves Company, if you've got these types of organizations, uh, this does span the, the towns on the Cape, so you know your communities better than I do, and I think this is a really good way to get started and, and bring a lot more energy into a, a group like this when you've got those types of professional organizations to, to help and support. And that's it. For, for lack of a keynote, thanks a lot. That is very impressive, and uh, I can just for one person, I did uh, learn a lot. Um, so how we're gonna work the rest of the night, we have two more speakers coming up uh, within the next uh, 15 minutes or so. I expect to take a short uh, bathroom break, stretching of the legs, and then we'll reconvene for a, uh, everyone will be back up here and we'll have a little panel discussion, Q&A. In the meantime, if anyone has any questions, um, uh, Karen Spencer has some index cards, she's gonna pass them out. Please write down your questions, and during the break, you can give them you know, up to me or to Karen. Um, so our next person we're gonna introduce is Ryan Sawyer. Ryan is a member of the Gloucester Cable Advisory Committee. He's also a data center engineer with EBSCO over at Ipswich. Um, so he has a unique uh, um, perspective based upon all the co-location uh, centers we've just been talking about. Here's Ryan. Thanks, Ari. Um, uh, I, uh, when I was asked to, it was, when I was given the opportunity to speak tonight, I saw the, the topic about um, uh, how communities can get there, and I, I saw that I, I was really excited because um, I, I, I think it's we we talk, we have all these conversations about all this all this infrastructure, and uh, I think one of the biggest challenges is how do we get there? And um, Ari introduced me a little bit. I'm, I live in Gloucester. I um, am a member of the Gloucester uh, Cable Advisory Committee, and um, I work in Ipswich at EBSCO Information Services. Um, I'm a senior lead data center engineer. Uh, when you hear when you hear the word cloud, um, these types of environments um, that are comprised of back-end data center infrastructure, network infrastructure, storage infrastructure, systems infrastructure. Um, Really, that's the work that I do is uh, I'm designing those types of environments, but also implementing those environments. That's what I do every day. And um, so um, just when we, 
when we when we think about how communities can get can get there, I think what we first have to do is take a step back and we have to break it down. We have to we have to we have to ask ourselves where we want to go. And um, I think one of the, the key the key components of that is uh, is exploring the problems within uh, within your community. Um, I think it's pretty. I, I, every community does have its own unique problems, but it also shares problems, common problems that other communities have. And um, I think it, it's it's important to express and frame those problems in a way, and to understand those and, and frame those problems in a way that really expose the solution. And um, one of the things that we've done in Gloucester um, throughout 2014 is um, through the Cable Advisory Committee, we've used that as a catalyst to discover those problems within, uh, within Gloucester. We've used the Cable TV Committee to uh, facilitate discussions on uh, all telecommunication services, whether it be you know, broadband, VoIP services, uh, wireless services throughout the city and um, and cable television and um, I and that's really been that exploratory phase over the year throughout the year has been really key um, it's we've we've come to understand a lot of the issues that are unique to Gloucester and some of those things I, I do want to share um, and uh, so when, when when we think about Gloucester uh, one of the most unique things about it is geographically, uh, it, the better part of Gloucester is on an island. Um, and over the over the course of the year, we've discovered that there's problems with middle mile fiber, uh, middle mile infrastructure, and last mile infrastructure. And um, one of the key things that we've discovered is that, and that's really come come up is that we really have no fiber optic diversity onto the island. There's one entry point onto the island. There's one cluster of conduit that goes through a canal onto the island. And while that's okay, um, that's not very robust. That doesn't. That doesn't. Um, that's not very robust middle mile, you know, infrastructure. What if something happened there? Um, you know, we can. Yes, we have some wireless backhaul services that we can rely on, but. You know, uh, those aren't going to those aren't going to carry the island. Those aren't going to, and the city of Gloucester. So you know, we've we've uncovered some middle mile challenges, and uh, Gloucester is also, you well, Gloucester has a, and when it comes to high speed broadband services, is essentially a monopoly. Um, we have Comcast. Um, Verizon has made it very clear that they, they're they are not going to invest in um, fiber optic and next generation broadband infrastructure in the city of Gloucester because, well, from a business perspective, it makes sense. There's no, there's really no return on investment to do that. And so, so um, Comcast, effectively, we have, we have a monopoly within the city of Gloucester in it. And, um, you know, some of the things that we've talked about tonight, you know, those, the, the lack of competition is, it, it it enables things like higher prices, um, their uh, you know lackluster service in rural areas and whatnot. And um, I think you know when we talk about high prices, that is a problem that we've discovered that Gloucester residents are sensitive to. Um, we have to be uh, mindful of the the you know the economic realities within Gloucester. It's been hit hard by fishing regulations, and there's a lot of people that um, you know. It, High prices, they're very sensitive to high prices, and we as a community need to understand that that is a fundamental problem. And so having a monopoly is, um, is not part of the solution. And, you know, I, uh, when we look at, when we look at the, uh, the, the lack of telecom uh, competition, um, I think it, it it ultimately hurts it ultimately hurts consumers um, and it really what it does is it enables bad behavior. Well, we have this monopoly monopoly it enables bad behavior on every level. Now I'm not saying Comcast is doing bad things. I'm not that's not what I'm saying. What the key word is it enables bad behavior. It enables things. It enables incumbent ISPs and these companies to um, take shortcuts and do do whatever they want on the local 
the regional, the state, the national level. I think it's really key to understand that. And, um, you know, it, we all know that ISP, these ISPs have become more powerful over the years. And really, I think it's, it's important to understand that the only way to combat that incumbent power is to, is to pool resources. It's to do, what, do things like we're doing tonight. It's to have forums like this. It's to collaborate with other municipalities. Talk about community, uh, unique challenges within different communities. To understand what problems we all share across communities in any given region. And when we come together and we collaborate, um, that, that essentially gives us more leverage. So, you know, um, you know like with, with Open Cape and whatnot, that, that collaboration, that regional collaboration, um, gave, provided them a lot more leverage so that the incumbent ISPs, um, it, it, that translates into power and it, you know, that's what you need you know, to combat these big ISPs. You need, you need leverage, you need power. So again, pooling resources and, and coming together is, I think, critical. And one of the last things I just wanted to mention is, you know, uh, heard a lot of discussions over the years on, you know, arguments against open fiber initiatives and whatnot. And you know, you probably heard the saying that, you know, just because we build it doesn't mean they will come. And that, and that, that's true. Just because you build it doesn't mean people will come. But I think the key thing is, uh, the key thing to take away is that open fiber initiatives, they, 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 uh, they enable new applications. The key word is, again, is enable. Um, they increase capacity, more robust telecommunication services. They enable new applications, um, you know, in educational spaces, government spaces, big business, um, you know, applications that we can, we can think of today, like, um, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're, there's um, open fiber communities that have used uh, the, those networks for smart grid technologies. You know, th that, is, that is a prime example of an application that we know we need to, um, we, ne we know we need to get behind to um, combat some of the, some of the um, energy challenges in front of us this, this century. And, you know, and, I, and my last point is there's so many applications that we don't even know about today. And if we don't, if we don't have the foundation on which to um, deploy those applications and services and whatnot, then really, what do we do? Um, I, you know, we saw a great, uh, we saw a great graphic about um, 2020, um, the average, broad, average broadband service being a gigabit. Well, these, these types of fiber networks take, take a long, a lot of planning. Uh, they take a lot of, uh, they take a long time to build. So if we know that's where we need to be, then we're, it's already 2014. So, you know, we're all, we're almost already behind in a way. So um, that's really all I wanted to share with you. Um, I'm sure my time is, is pretty much up. But uh, yeah, so again, it's, I think the key is to focus on the problems, understand the problems within each community, and then come together and collaborate. And which is, which is fantastic that we're, we have this tonight. I think it's, 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 uh, it's fantastic. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mario. Thanks, Ryan. Um, and I'd like to uh, call upon uh, Don Skein. Uh, Don is the Technology Director, Technology Manager, I call him my IT man, at the New Report School Department. Um, Don and I uh, first started working together probably about four or five years ago when, during that whole Google Fiber initiative, and um, Don was one of the key players that helped bring uh, folks come together to uh, you know, sign those petitions. Um, you all set? Or do you need a minute?
This is where the IT guy screws up the TV. Uh, as a, thank you, Ari. Uh, my name is Don Scame, I'm the IT manager here at New Report. Um, I'm the troglodyte. I'm the one that hides behind the walls, I'm not used to speaking to people in big forums like this, so please bear with me. Um, I started here in 1998 um, as a consultant, um, and I ended up being hired here full time back in 2000. Um, so I've been here when the the high school had about 50 computers. There was 100 computers in the entire district, and now we have about 1,200 devices. Um, three big buildings were interconnected with fiber, um, and broadband is something we have and require in education. And Ari asked me to speak specifically to broadband uses in education. Um, and when we talk about that, people tend to think more about app-specific, hardware-specific, a little kid with a tablet, a kid doing research, writing a paper. But there's something in, in education that people tend to forget, and the, the big one is, is the business of the education. What I mean by that is basically, we're like a company. Um, we have a CEO, our superintendent, we have a board of directors, we are a school committee, our principals might be our regional area directors, our department heads, our middle managers. And with that, we have the same departments that any corporation or business our size would have. Um, we have a human resources department. Uh, they use Aspen. Um, those of you that are parents here are aware of Aspen. Um, it's where you can log in and see what your kids have or have not done in school, uh, the grades. But it also tracks uh, the employee piece, the uh, demographics, the certifications they have, their uh, degrees. Uh, we have a payroll software. Uh, we have hourly employees, they get overtime, they get deductions, health, uh, dental. We have accounting software, our Munis software. This allows us, just like in a corporation, we're gonna cut POs, we're gonna write warrants out for the school committee, write checks, pay bills. Um, we have an email countering software, uh, calendaring uh, applications. Uh, last year, we cut over to Google. Uh, we use Gmail for our email service uh, and Google Apps for our calendaring. Uh, we have a point of sale system uh, in the cafeteria. The kids don't come in with cash much anymore. Parents can log in, deposit money, and then the kids come in and type a code and, and they can have their lunch and it subtracts off the total. Um, no bullies taking their lunch money, no lost money in the snow banks. Um, and we have Blackboard Connect, which is like our equivalent of constant contact. Um, basically it tracks the staff and the student home uh, email addresses, uh, phone numbers, so that we can send out emails or telephone calls. Uh, one thing they go out daily is if your uh, student uh, wasn't in and you didn't call in, a call goes home and says, why wasn't your student in school today? Uh, the one thing that all these applications have in common is they're all services. None of these applications live in our building. We're logging into these sites and we're using these throughout the day. And this is, this is what our broadband's used and we haven't even gotten into the classroom. We're required to file state reports three times a year, basically snapshots of where our school is at. And there's student data involved and there's teacher data involved in that. And that data needs to be cross-validated. So if Susie had Mrs. Smith in first quarter, Susie needs to have Mrs. Smith at the end of the quarter. All of this data is done via broadband. Uh, the age of accountability, I'm not getting into the politics of all the stuff. Um, a lot of it is here already. Um, you're looking at those new rules regarding teacher evaluations. Not only do principals or their supervisors need to go into classrooms and observe more, but there's we implemented a new program called Baseline Edge. And what this allows the teachers to do is, is uh, develop goals. I wanna involve more technology in my English course, something like that. Uh, since a principal or supervisor can't be in a classroom every class, um, this allows the teacher to say, hey, this is something that's really good and it's really meeting my goal. They're able to take a picture, take a video, take some sample work, put it into Baseline Edge. And the supervisor or principal is able to go in there and look at that and make comments and feedback. So you're getting a lot more uh, supervision inside the classroom. Again, this is online information. And this is all stuff that doesn't even get into the classroom. We haven't even talked about what the kids use. In the classroom, these are some of our most popular apps. People look at Netflix and they chuckle. We're not catching up on last season, say yes to the dress. Uh, there's a lot of good documentaries on there. A lot of good stuff that's actually useful in the classroom. My little bit of politicking is, these companies could probably afford fast lanes, but the next slide 
these are other applications we deal with on a daily basis that probably would not be able to, not without charging it back to the schools. And as you know, schools' budgets are always, you know, a push and pull. Uh, Lexi is a reading application. Destiny, uh, library software. If you look around, you'll notice there's no card catalog system. Remember the old pull out the drawers, look through the note cards? Those don't exist anymore, and they haven't for at least a decade. Destiny is an online service that we provide. All of our books are up there. The kids go to a computer, type in what book they're looking for, tells them where it is. When they check a book in or out, or a piece of equipment, or anything, that scan goes to the Destiny site. Kids can check out ebooks through Destiny, um, and that's basically the entire library for all three buildings are run through that one suite. Virtual high school, as budgets became tighter and you know time in the day became a little bit more tight as well, um, a lot of electives really couldn't keep going on the way they were going. You can't have a class with three kids in it. But virtual high school allows basically these kids to subscribe to an online course and participate in it during the day. Can't do that if the internet's out or if the internet's being bogged down by something else. Uh, type to learn, remember some of you people are older like me, you remember uh, the teacher walking down the road going A, S, D, F, and E, sit there and you type it. That's gone now. Now type to learn, it's an online environment, the kids log in, they have accounts, and the teacher's able to log in and see their progress. How many words per minute they're typing, how many errors, and they can actually say, Susie, you need to work on this, Jimmy, you need to work on that. Naviance for our seniors. Um, it's a place where um, a lot of the data that they've accumulated over the high school gets put up. Kids can go in there and see, you know, what their GPA is and their SAT scores, um, and see what colleges might be a good fit for them. You know, if, if they're at a certain GPA level, maybe they're not really going to be going to Harvard. But there's a whole bunch of other schools that you can look at. Um, it helps kind of narrow down where they might want to apply. The common application is a college application process that a lot of universities have gone on. That plugs in with Naviance. Um, so the seniors, you know, when they're looking for schools to go, they're online, they're doing that research. Moodle, if anyone's taking an online course using Blackboard, um, Moodle is the open source version of that. We run that here in this district. Um, allows teachers to create classes, submit work, uh, get kids to blog back and forth, basically. BrainPop is a real popular application. Um, it basically allows a teacher to drill down to subject, to area, to specific goal. Um, and there's games, animation, videos that kids can interact with and um, basically learn a little in a different manner. All of these are used throughout the day. Larry also asked me to discuss what the future's gonna bring. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know exactly what the future's gonna bring. So I'm looking just a couple years down the road. Google Classroom just got uh, released last month, late August. Um, it's kind of like a Moodle on steroids. Um, I honestly, with the buildings over there, haven't had a lot of chance to play with it, but a few teachers that have, have loved it. Uh, flip the classroom, for those that don't know what that is, uh, that's kind of like uh, what we're doing here. You know, we're doing the boring lecture piece. Um, flip the classroom would be the teacher doing their lecture piece and would put it up like on YouTube or something like that where the students would watch that at home for homework. And then they, when they come into the class, they're doing the actual physical work. So instead of them going home and saying, Mom, I can't remember this, or Dad, I need help with this, the teacher's in the room with them. Uh, future exams. Last year we trialed PARC. Again, I'm not getting into whether it's a good test or bad test, but the online exam piece actually worked pretty well. Um, it uh, had very few errors, and um, it saves a ton of time. MCAS, it can take an admin because it's such a secure test and physical, paper, it can take an admin a week to collect all the tests back, get it packaged up and secured and mailed back to the companies. Um, the internet will be more immersive and interactive. There's, it always has been. Think back to when you had the 28K modem and you went up to the 56K modem. And try and imagine just trying to load CNN today on that. Um, the other thing is upload speed is going to become much more important than it is today. We, uh, for those of you that don't know, your internet is not the same up as it is down. In this building, uh, we have a big project where a bunch of kids create a lot of videos. They upload the videos to YouTube, they go over to the distance learning lab, and they all put, watch their YouTube videos. Having 30 kids in this library trying to push up 30 videos to YouTube can cause a huge bottleneck. bottleneck. And when you start throttling, you're hitting the top of your upload, that affects your download speed as well. Um, and that's all the time I got and all I have. Thank you. Great, thanks.
Thanks. Um, welcome back. Uh, I'd like to introduce um, one other. I'd like to introduce two people who uh, you haven't heard from yet today. Um, one is all the way to my left is Kevin Bow. Uh, Kevin can uh, can share some insight uh, from the town of West Newbury, which is unique in the area in the sense that they they're a town. They do not have a municipal light plant, yet they have both Comcast and Verizon Fios. And I say they don't have a light plant because my my research is that every other community in the North Shore that has Verizon Fios has a light plant. But I don't know. Um, the other person I'd like to introduce all the way on my far left is Karen Spencer. Um, Karen works, well, Karen can talk about herself. She's on the uh, Cable Advisory Committee in Gloucester. We were introduced four and a half years ago by Stan McGee, who is the former uh, policy director for economic development under Governor Patrick. And uh, Stan knew that Karen was working on broadband initiatives in Gloucester. Stan knew that I was working on initiatives here in Newburyport. And he sent an email, as I quote, I found this, quote, given that Newburyport is within the line of sight of Gloucester, there may be future opportunities for collaboration on broadband connectivity issues. So isn't that apropos here tonight? Um, Gloucester, Newburyport, West Newbury, um, I know in the room we have Peabody and many other communities. And what other communities are in the room? We have Peabody, I know. Who else is here? Salisbury. Salisbury. Lowell. Lowell. So, awesome. Um, and also to my far right here, again, is Sarah Hayden, who's the Executive Director of Port Media. Thank you for joining this panel. Um, I guess I'd like to turn it over the mic over to Karen, and I will take a seat in the audience and, and take notes. Thank you, Ari. Yes, I'm delighted to see people from different communities. One of the things that we've been talking about in Gloucester or in Cape Ann is that most of these places that get the big millions, the, the 32 million, the 100 million, whatever, um, like Cape Cod, were groups of, of communities. So we've you know, done the numbers, and we've seen that if you combine the Cape Ann communities with the Newburyport area communities, you have 100,000 people. That sounds like a pretty good number to me. It's going to get a lot more attention than 13,000 or 27,000 or whatever. So th this, this is the beginning of our networking. That's why Gloucester is here. That, that, that's why we want to be here. We want to network with you folks. Um, Joe Garland, a famous author down in Gloucester, used to call this area the Gold Coast. It used to be very, very profitable from the New Hampshire border down through Manchester with the fishing industry. Fishing industry is in decline. We don't want to become the Ghost Coast. We want to be the Gold Coast. We, do want to, we need the infrastructure. But we don't have much time, so we're going to get right on to the um, questions. We've got a lot of excellent questions. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if we're going to be able to get to all of them, but we're going to try. So please, folks, um, keep your answers kind of concise, but let's see what we can do um, with the questions. I have a bunch here, but we had a few that were specifically directed to Open Cape. So um, and, um, Dan, I gave you those questions. What, why don't you start? with um, answering those questions a little bit, please. Yes, no. <laughs> first question was, when did Open Cape uh, go online? And it was a gradual process. Our first customer came on in April of 2013, and that was uh, a service to Otis Air National Guard Base. The uh, Air Force, our, the Air National Guard Intelligence Wing that operates there needed bandwidth for their real-time uh, operations they have going there. And now they actually have two connections uh, for redundancy on our network. Can we just run through all of them? Yeah, why don't you? Uh, so it's going online. How much has Open Cape's traffic grown? That makes me groan because that's one of the things I keep beating up our operating partner on to get all that monitoring really put together and in place. So unfortunately, it's a question I can't answer right now. When I get the information, I'd be happy to share it, but right now I just don't have it. Uh, when Open Cape was being planned, what type of roadblocks were put up by the incumbents? And again, I wasn't here, but the story I hear was actually very little. And that was really because they had support agreements or support letters in place from all 15 towns, all school districts, the county. They had support, some of it, you know, begrudgingly from some of the state elected officials. And they had support from the, uh, you know, federal officials, uh, congressmen and, and senators as well. So with that type of support, Comcast really couldn't mount a, a hard um, counterattack like they had in some other locations, especially municipally owned networks. Um, are public educational and government access organizations using the fiber for real-time video transmission? 
I think right now uh, the schools are doing a little bit of that, trying out some trials in the, the shared classroom environment, again, driven by the community college. Uh, I think a lot more is about to come online because we really just got the town halls hooked up through the county contract that kind of delayed us about a year, actually, uh, in getting some of the town halls hooked up. And those guys are really interested in the streaming of you know, town meetings and such things. So I think that's going to be a, a big uptick here uh, beginning of next year. Uh, the gigabit network capacity, um, you know, I throw out some numbers there. With the 100 gigabit connection that we have, uh, going from Barnstable Data Center off to Brockton, for example, that's on a pair of fibers. And that's really the, the most economically feasible speed at this point. If you go to research organizations that are running Optronics that will run two to 3,000 times that speed, but it's just not commercially viable yet. Uh, we've got other fibers that are running only at a one gig, and that's a service ring that the actual customers connect to. So we've got different speeds running in different, you know, physical fiber strands. So, you know, if we were to light up everything at 100 gig, which we could if we had, you know, the capital expenditure to improve the electronics, uh, we could run everything at 100 gig and take 100 gig times, you know, 72 uh, pair of fibers, and that's a lot of capacity. Um, but, you know, again, a pair of fibers is running 100 gig right now for our backhaul connections. Right. Thank you. Um, I have another question here that I think actually might be a great one for our um, our state rep here. It's what about the mass broadband initiative? That's the other big initiative that's in the state. Cape Cod is one. The other one is out in the western part of the state. Um, Lenny, can you can you address that? Do you, do you know anything about that? That did bring a lot of fiber to the western part of the state, and it was very successful. I don't know if they're done yet, but uh, it did work out quite well. Uh, it happened years ago, long before I took office, so I'm not um, exactly up on how exactly it, it um, got done. I don't know how it got financed. I don't know how it got implemented. Uh, it happened years ago. But uh, it, it did work out because there were parts of the state that just didn't have this access. Well, that, that was also funded through the BTOP grants, weren't, weren't they, Kate? Um, Open cable the same way as um, you, you guys were funded. Yeah, MBI got a BTOP grant. MBI received a VTOP grant the same as we did. They were in the, uh, the second phase of grants, and I think it was around 45 to 50 million. And then the state you know, had a bunch of additional money in there. Uh, the state continues to fund uh, MBI through MTC. Because of the broadband reviews, they identified 20 communities that were unserved or underserved, and 19 of those are Western Mass. One is in my area, which is Gosnold, which, you know, kind of being an island, is really you know, a challenge to really bring them fiber. But there's another 50 million that just got approved to MBI for that that last mile part of the project, and unfortunately, if they really wanted to do last mile to all the homes out there, they probably need 110 to 120 million. So uh, the state has fiber on my network. So one of my board members is a, a staff at Mass IT. So it, it, we got five million from MBI from MTC as part of our matching. So I'm very familiar with what they've been doing out there. Yeah, the state was invested in that, and Governor uh, Patrick was really um, going for it. And you also have a question. Well, just address that. I mentioned the uh, whole issue of rural broadband. Actually, a global issue um, where these people in the Western Mass are literally on dial. Um, so, we talk about a digital divide. Right? Okay. Uh, that's an area I don't mind the government spending money because it's so financially. Un, or it's uneconomical for a private company to serve those communities. It just doesn't, especially as you get into higher bandwidth. You, you do the numbers, they stick. Um, you know, some of the question, uh, uh, any way to lobby or you know, pressure Verizon to do files and do a report? Um, well, I'd love to get files, because uh, I'm not a Comcast fan either. Um, but stop. Um, I don't know if it's too late to be honest with you because they have you know finite amount of capex capital expenditure um, they have gone to states that give them statewide franchising which i don't blame them one bit um, but that's how you get competition that's how you get gigabit and is you create market driven competition and by giving so i would call it files verizon and just say give them a, what i call a no strings attached franchise for the city of newburyport no plum island 
no fire trucks, no school wings, just give them the franchise and hopefully that will be enough because it's an ideal community for fiber. It's dense, a lot of aerial wires, easy to deploy, you know, big enough streets and affluent. I mean, it's the triple play, so to speak, for uh, FIOS. And just, you know, don't, don't negotiate and try to, uh, you know, squeeze them for something. No port media. The, the, that's like part it. of the cable act. They'll, they'll get that. That's, that's, you know, that's a given. And call, channels are a given. and call Wareham and ask them what they did, because it's my understanding four or five years ago they did the same thing. Just said, get in here, build out. We want to improve our community. It's not affluent. And they did get Verizon Files in there. I don't know if it's been successful for them, but town officials and Wareham might have some info there. Don, you have something to add? Uh, Kevin, actually. Oh, Kevin, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, well, I, I guess I have a question about Verizon's um, uh, insistence that they don't want to expand FIOS because of the um, local municipalities um, licensing them. Um, I just couldn't understand it during our license process because we were obligated in our Comcast uh, contract to, that if we had provided fav more favorable terms to a second provider that we would automatically have to grant those terms to Comcast. So there really wasn't any negotiation. You know, they all, by, uh, all Com uh, excuse me, Verizon has to do is pull the contract for every single um, municipality and say, we match it. The, the franchise process is over. So I, I don't know whether they, they're, they don't understand that simple concept, concept or whether they have, you know, another motive. And, you know, they, they had a law a bill in Massachusetts that would have granted, you know, statewide uh, situation. And that in, definitely was, part of that was going after public access funds. They would have just done a blanket, you know, 2%, 3%, sometimes in negotiated better fees. And so it, I've got a little bit of experience working as a vendor to some of the uh, broadband companies. And I do know that they're always looking to cutting their costs. And you know, if they can not pay a couple of extra dollars, if, if, if the consumer doesn't pay a couple of extra dollars for public access, that could be a couple of extra dollars that they could charge on their bill. So again, I, I don't know if, if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more as why is that uh, an, an onerous regulation where all they had to do was match the, um, the, the present contract. I don't know the specific Newbury report, but as a general rule of thumb in FIOS, where they, you know, they have a finite amount of capex, and they just get tired of dealing with every town. And the word from people I know uh, on the other side were saying, you know, they just get tired of being shaken down every town. So they just, you know, went to the state. Texas was a great one because they had state wide franchise. So. Again, they're not getting shaken down. They just need to pay the same terms that the current provider is paying. So some questions are perhaps too big to settle tonight. <laughs> Let's see if we can go on a couple of others, and I'm gonna throw this open and just raise your hand if you want to take the first stab at it. Um, how far are we from edge wireless being effective, cost effective? And from a consumer perspective, how do you perceive the programming component, i.e. content, working in conjunction with a fiber network? Anyone like to address one or both of those? Are we talking about wireless edge speed? I mean, uh, wireless edge network, that's old. It's going away. It's going to be replaced with the you know, 4G and some of the 5G. Um, and uh, as far as cost effectiveness, um, wireless networks, I mean, from my understanding, I'm a layman, but wireless networks are much more difficult um, to ramp up than a physical network like Comcast. Like you were speaking about how you have dark fiber. You theoretically can ramp up just by lighting up another pair of fiber. Um, wireless networks are much more uh, much more difficult. So I think the cost isn't going to be there anytime soon. Uh, actually, I, I, well, there's probably, I think the reason is because you don't have to, if you have fiber, it's one thing, but the thing with even your fiber, you come out of the ground with a condo with 144 fibers, 142 fibers, you have a tough fiber. You want to go across the building, you're in trouble. Like New York, you come out of a building, you're on net, there's a ton of bandwidth. You're literally across the street, you're paying full tariffs. So it's a big difference whether you're on the fiber net. But the thing with wireless, 
you know, I mentioned the cell towers popping up and getting more and more complex with more radio heads. Uh, that's one of the things, if you look at Verizon, they're actually selling their towers. It's, it's sort of like a, a new business, but the speeds there with 4G and now what they call LTE, which just stands for long-term long -term evolution, is dash A, which is advanced, you know, tons of standards work. They're on like draft 13 or something. Like, um, they're talking, you know, they're up to speeds of, you know, 500 meg um, for that five mile, you know, within the macro tower. Another big issue is small cells, which is what it sounds like. It's a much smaller cell. You put it around town, so you basically have the same amount of capacity serving less customers. So that's, that's a big trend, but the problem is with that is you're running into power backhaul and, you know, where do you put the tower? Who do you have to pay? You know, you want a light bulb? Well, you got to pay someone for the light bulb. You got to run fiber to the light bulb. Um, it, it's again, it's, it's a lot of deep, you know, non-technical details that prohibit this, the rollout. Give me for rushing you guys, but I want to get to as many of these as we can. Roy, you get something? Yeah, just one comment on that question. Um, uh, one thing I think is very important to realize is that uh, robust wireless networks ultimately re rely on robust fiber optic infrastructure. Um, and I grew up in Western Mass, and where their uh, wireless performance was always, wireless and wireline performance was always uh, very, very lackluster. Uh, we were always very far behind. We we're playing catch up. Uh, one of the reasons why wireless was so poor is because there was so little fiber optic infrastructure. So again, the more, the more fiber optic infrastructure we have through open fiber initiatives and whatnot, the more robust our wireless infrastructure can, can become and grow. Thank you. Nice transition. Should we have a new city committee for broadband as a utility, or perhaps a regional committee to um, talk about this? And that was an excellent question asked by Peter Simmons, who would like to um, field that. Um, I'd like to suggest that perhaps the regional approach would probably be better. Um, as I was describing earlier when I was speaking, uh, when Mira Company does a job, if there's three jobs in Newburyport and four in Salisbury and five in West Derby, that, that means we have to make a stop, a permit for every single one of those. And it's bad enough in a city, but when you go to a small town, say Groveland, and you, your permit perhaps has to go to, I don't know, the Board of Selectmen or something, that would may meet on the second Thursday of every month, and if the August agenda is full, maybe they'll fit you in on Wednesday. And that just adds time, it adds expense, that doesn't help anybody. And you also have a lack of expertise, perhaps, on a lot of towns who don't know what's involved in getting these things approved. If we had a regional approach, then uh, the, the board could be uh, trained and have expertise of what it takes to get this done appropriately, and it'll be done in a more timely manner, and probably a more efficient manner. So probably the regional approach would be best of all, um, and they could perhaps liaise on through the building departments in each city and town. Uh, yeah, just, uh, uh, <clears throat> I guess my more fundamental question is, and it probably should go to the whole panel, should uh, fiber infrastructure be viewed are taken as a utility. I mean, these fibers will go into the ground and they'll last a hundred years as far as people know. And they can be expanded in capacity as uh, has been said through electronics. I mean, you can get uh, a terabyte uh, per second on those fibers you put in easily. In WDM, you can expand almost infinitely. So you can put this stuff in the ground, and you can pay for it over the next 500 years. So why why are we messing around the way we are? Would you like to say something? You haven't said anything. In terms of what he has just said, yeah. I mean, I think it's very important to have um, a, a regional group working on this. As far as a utility, I'm not sure. I think um, I think. Yes, but I'm not, you know, I think I need to have more information to really understand, but I think that in order to have, I, I just think it's important for everybody to be able to have access to internet. It's, it's so essential, it's so important that it should be, it, it, it's, it's shocking that this is a, a small, I mean, it's a large group, yes, I see a large group, but it, that it's such a small group, that this is not so important to everybody, actually. So, yeah, 
Did, did you want to say something? Yeah, I got to say something on this one. Um, <clears throat> let me explain why regulating broadband is the worst thing you can do. During the regulated phone company business, they would, they would depreciate equipment over 30 years, right? Because asset-based pricing, keep your asset base high, 30-year depreciation. So your innovation cycle is 30 years. Now you have a competitive environment, an unregulated environment for broadband. They want to depreciate gear over uh, seven years. It's basically being tossed out every three to five years. So now your innovation cycle is three or five years. So ask yourself, do you want a 30-year innovation cycle? Or do you want a three to five year innovation cycle? Because that's what regulation will do. As I said earlier, regulations will kill gigabit rollouts in their nascency. Could I respond? Yeah. Well, we are just about out of time, and I want to kind of wrap up the last few questions, Peter, and then hang around and ask some more questions afterwards, OK? Um, the last few questions all seem to be around the consumer. You know, what speed um, is needed to get to the homes? What hard cha hardware changes are needed to get to the consumer? Um, Open Cape is a middle mile network connecting, connecting to communities, but about, 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 what, what about the residents? Um, do the residents get more op options? Um, how about, well, I think that's about it. Who would like to start on answering that? And I think that's gonna be our last question for the evening. Because it was a specific about Open Cape, I'll address that first. We get calls every week, Cape Net gets calls every week for people looking for competition uh, for Comcast, or looking for alternatives. If you provide them an alternative, then you know it's still hard to get people to change at some point because there will be differences in the service. So uh, we're in the same environment that you are right now in terms of looking for how do we do fiber at home. It does cost money. If we're just offering internet service, then cable franchise rules don't apply but everybody still wants to watch their sports teams and whatever else. So it, it's an interesting and active discussion within our company. As far as the speeds required, I think you need a mix of speeds based on the customer. Uh, I remember not too long ago when my mom was still on dial-up and I moved her to a faster speed you know, wireless connection, so it's not great, but she was good, more than happy to go out and start downloading her email go back to the kitchen, make a cup of coffee, <laughs> check the uh, uh, newspaper, go back out and you know look at her email. She doesn't need a gig, doesn't want a gig, doesn't want to pay for a gig, but I think you need that tiered services and people will pay for what they think they need. Would anyone else like to respond to questions about what, what this means to the residents? Yeah? I could, I don't want to be involved. I live this stuff every day. So. All right, well, it is exactly 9 o'clock, so I'm going to give you one minute, right. Greg. <laughs> and then thank one you second. so much for coming and staying. Oh, yeah, I, I literally do this every day, 24-7, um, seven, seven days a week. Um, so as far as the home, you're right about the, the bandwidth. Um, you know, pricing is, we did a study way back when with Intel, uh, Com not Comcast, Compaq, and Microsoft. And they came up with a number where it was 50 bucks for 40 megabytes, or at the time, a megabit, people had a general willingness to pay for 50, $50 a month. And for um, two megabit, it was $50 a month. And for five meg, it was $50 a month. So there is, you know, consumer, uh, a finite amount of uh, spending they can, you know, what's the term, like for the uh, consumer, consumer spending, whatever, disposable income. As far as the technology in the home, I mean, Wi-Fi is <clears throat> way faster than your broadband. <clears throat> like now, it's going to get faster. The thing when you deploy fiber, you have to is a piece of gear that sits uh, somewhere in the neighborhood, or it's called the ONU, OMT, I think it was a little daylight out here with the details. Um, you, you know, the telco or the cable company needs to deploy a box in your house and then basically connect it to your, your Wi Fi. And uh, so everything, Wi Fi is, there's two things in the industry never bet against Ethernet, and I've changed it to never bet against Wi Fi. It is so, so if you have a good Wi Fi network, you know, you're good to go because that's getting fast. You probably have to replace your access point every few years. But you need the fiber to stop the Wi-Fi. Thank you so much. Correct. I didn't undermine you totally with that. Well, the fiber? Yeah, you need fiber. Fiber's good. Yeah, fiber's good. Thank you so much, folks, for coming. We don't want to keep you past 9 o'clock. We said we're going to end at 9 o'clock. But if you want to stay and talk some more with our experts, thank you very much. And thank you, Ari. Where's Ari? For sponsoring us.
Well, thanks a lot, Karen. I mean, I, I couldn't be here without you originally and, and with everyone to thank for the panel. Thanks for, for agreeing to be part of this. Um, you know, I, I look back to uh, I look back to, to February. You know, I mentioned I had written a letter to the editor, and uh, people from some communities showed up. And uh, you know, I hadn't really thought about it at the time about bridging, you know, expanding it beyond the immediate uh, uh, eastern portion of the Merrimack Valley. So um, you know, I, I look at everyone here, so I think it's great. Um, if if I if you did not come here through Eventbrite. That means I do not have your email address. If you signed up through Eventbrite, I have your email address and I'll let you know of uh, future events. Um, otherwise, let me know how to contact you. And um, if anyone wants to stick around and answer any questions, if anyone here wants to ask any questions, the school's not kicking us out until 10 o'clock. So that's it for me. Thanks.